13, 13.2, and we are glad to present the microgrid sizing for resiliency project. The team consists of Felix Abel, Jonathan Monroy, Derek Casaneda, Devin Cordero, Carlos Radenzo, and me, Christian Flores. So in the team organization chart as shown, we could see that the team is being advised by Dr. Chaverity with the customer being Southern California Edison. As for the team members, the team lead is me, Christian, who was involved with the photovoltaic power uh, simulations, battery simulations, and the microgrid operations team. Felix Abel has been working on the PV simulations, the battery simulations, and also the operational cost. Jonathan contributed to battery but is now working on diesel generator subteams. Devin is leading the task for the diesel, the emergency diesel generator team. And Derek and Carlos and Jonathan are, are working on the diesel generator subteam to develop a frequency stability plan by use of droop control. I'm gonna hand it to Derek to discuss about the introduction. Hello everyone, I'm Derek Asnea and I will be doing the introduction. So what is a microgrid? A microgrid is a local energy grid with control capability. The main difference between a traditional grid and a microgrid is everyone is affected when repairing a traditional grid. Now, why renewable energy-based options? We need to maximize the penetration of renewable energy-based generations and it provides reliable energy reliable power supplies and fuel diversification. Enhances energy security and helps conserve natural resources. What is the problem? So for power outages are now an accepted practice. In 2019, SoCal Edison cut the power to about 200,000 customers. The resiliency of a system is defined as its ability to return to a stable operation point after a major disruption event, such as fires, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. Microgrids are considered as a potential solution to deal with major power disruption events. Now I'll be discussing about the statement of work. So in the project, we had a model of microgrid system and study the limitations of the operational strategy. Modeling consisted of creating a microgrid in both grid connected and isolated modes. Also, the architecture that we use was a photovoltaic plus battery um, system, which provided power to the load. After developing a model of the microgrid, we need to determine the cost of the system and analyze the system's resiliency. So the team's functional requirement for the microgrid are to keep the microgrid system functioning properly by stabilizing the frequency of the system. We will need to analyze the operation scheme by determining any cost and revenue for the microgrid system. Finally, we must provide a functioning microgrid that meets the loads that meet the profile. For the, perform for the performance requirement, we must achieve to stabilize the shift in frequency from 60 Hertz within a 5% range. We will need to use the drip control method to find the failure points with the demand profile. The simulation of the microgrid must keep a resiliency for more than four hours during operation. I'm gonna hand it over to Devin, Carlos, Jonathan, and Derek to discuss their emergency diesel generator tasks. Uh, we created a simulated model of an emergency diesel generator in island mode. The purpose of the simulation is to determine the limitations of the microgrid system. On the left, you can see the, our complete model of our emergency diesel generator. Okay, so then uh, narrowing down from the, the system, our first subsystem is the power to current block. So that's a 1D lookup table was used that contained an Excel sheet with GHI information that was converted to real power. The real power simulates the inclusion of a photovoltaic solar panel. Unfortunately, there was not a dynamic power block. So we needed to convert real power to current and then inject it into the model. 
Now this connection from grid. Here we have a thousand MVA power source used to emulate the traditional power grid. So remember this model is expected to be disconnected from the microgrid. So when the circuit breaker is open, the system is in island mode. This also includes a 25 kilovolt to 200, 2400 step down transformer to lower the voltage down for consumer use. Subsystem is the load demand. So another uh, 1D lookup table was used containing 24 hours worth of real power data. The data was inquired from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, better known as NREL. It was decided to put a gain of 10,000 to make the net load equal to the nominal power of the diesel generator. Uh, the excitation block models an AC alternator driving a dial rectifier to produce the field voltage required by the synchronous machine. We had options such as AC1A, AC4A, AC5A, and DC1A. We chose to use AC1A because its voltage regulator gave a voltage in per unit with a lower limit of zero. This was a great fit to our model because most of our values were in per unit. So the diesel engine governor controls fuel to the engine cylinders in order to control the speed of the unit. And the speed is to be held constant for all loads imposed on the generator being driven by the engine. The first input is labeled W ref is the, and is the reference speed. The second input is the is labeled W and is the measured speed. Output is the diesel engine mechanical power. The picture on the right represents a subsystem. With this block, it's the synchronous machine, which can have uh, both synchronous motors and generators. Since uh, we have been developing a microgrid, an AC system is essential since the grid is composed of three phases AC power. AC power is uh, used for generation, transmission, and distribution of electrical power. And this machine converts mechanical power into AC electrical power. At the steady state, the rotation of the shaft is uh, synchronized with the frequency of the supply current. And by adjusting the excitation of a synchronous motor, uh, it can be made to operate at a lagging, leading, and a unity power factor. This feature uh, lets us control power factor and further use it for power factor correction. Uh, since most power systems of any significant size have a net lagging power factor, the presence of this synchronous machine in our system uh, improves our power factor closer to unity, improving efficiency. This is the graphical representation of the PQ load information uh, that was mentioned earlier. We are considering a 100% power factor for simulation purposes, which is why the blue line, the Q signal is zero. Uh, but for, for the simulation, we use 10 hours worth of the data uh, because it would allow the simulation to simulate more efficiently. The graph represented to the right is the data we use from the PQ signal for a simulation, which represents 10 hours. Uh, our WM is represented as the machine speed of a synchronous machine. When the diesel generator kicks in, the speed of the synchronous machine should be as close to one as possible to keep it in unity factor. The synchronous machine mechanical power can be expressed by using the shaft angular speed multiplied by the torque. By having a correct mechanical power output, we can determine and calculate the synchronous machine efficiency. The efficiency will, will reduce the losses mainly due to the resistive losses and windings, uh, core losses and mechanical losses in the bearings. On top of that, the improvement in efficiency reduces utility charges when it's connected to the grid, which uh, is essential with designing a microgrid and that will reduce our costs as much as possible. Now we have the synchronous machine fill voltage. The graph on the, on the left uh, shows the fill voltage uh, input. The voltage is supplied by, the, by a voltage regulator and it's usually constant. By keeping these value constant, we can keep a constant power delivery, which becomes really important when dealing with uh, different kind of customers where their need, where their electrical needs are different. Now we have the synchronous machine terminal voltage, which uh, represents the terminal voltage of the system. When we have uh, the microgrid disconnected from the grid, the voltage is zero or very close to zero. This variable measures the potential difference between the terminal of the system which can help us determine our current and power as needed. 
So here we have our negative current subsystem. Uh, the purpose of the subsystem was the same as the purpose of the power to current block. However, the controlled current source is in this model was made to give off a negative current. Uh, to make our current a negative current, we decided to connect the positive side to ground and the negative to the, to the system. We figured since there wasn't a way to change the direction of the current block, this would be the next best thing. Uh, this subsystem was for the dynamic load, which needed a negative current to go through it. Now, why is this important? So this allows for operation operational costs to be analyzed and operational strategy limitations can be studied and approved upon. This provides us with information on how long it takes this to it takes the grid to react to to be this after it's disconnected from the traditional grid and provides frequency stability for the microgrid system. So now I'll be discussing about component modeling of power sources. An important component of the microgrid is the power source. The PV panel serves as this power supply in the microgrid. We need to model the power output of the panels, but we will be able to supply power to the battery and also the load. The excess power that is produced from the PV will be fed directly to the main grid to generate revenue, which will reduce the operational cost of the microgrid. To model a PV system, we need to set some parameters for the relationship between GHI and photovoltaic power output. The photovoltaic efficiency is set to 20%. The area of the PV panels spans uh, 7,153 meters squared. This area is determined for the modeling and provides sufficient power to charge both the battery and also provide power to the distribution load. The raw global horizontal irradiance known as GHI is data that's obtained from the year 2018. It comes from the National Solar Radiation Database. The data was recorded daily within a 30 minute interval. Using these parameters, we were able to determine a relationship for the power output of the PV panel. The photovoltaic model outputs an average hourly solar energy generation. The plot reveals that the PV power output increases and is reaching peak power during the midday. This curve was considered for the operation scheme, which we will discuss later. So to model the battery system, we determined parameters such as radiant capacity and efficiency from a software that sizes the battery according to the load profile. Sizing of the battery will later be discussed. The model needs to show the battery's state of charge. State of charge is represented as percentage points from zero to 100%. The equation shown is showing the relationship between charge and discharge current profiles to the battery SOC level. For system testing, the live simulation we used was, called, was Simscape, and we used the generic battery model to determine the SOC level of the battery throughout a day. This is how we obtained the graph, the graph shown. Some important points to consider was the limits for draining and charging the SOC level. At the level of 40% as shown by the green arrow, this is the limit that the battery will not be able to discharge any further. At this level, the battery will then charge to 90%. At the SOC level at 90% or above, the battery will later inject the energy into the main power grid. This generates a source of income. This is also later discussed in the operation scheme. So to expand on this battery model, we determine a battery's depth of discharge, which is the percentage of the battery's capacity that has been removed from the state of charge levels. Depth of discharge is inverse of the state of charge. Similar to the state of charge plot, um, 
um, BOD changes throughout the day, depending on the load. We also consider to show the battery's degradation by modeling how the depth of discharge affects battery performance through what's called capacity fade. So using, a, using data obtained from a Trojan battery data sheet, we were able to construct a capacity fade block plot. We used the number of cycles onto failure and related it to the depth of discharge of the battery. This was used to determine a lifetime throughput of the battery, which was then useful for determining cost of the battery degradation. I'll be passing it on to Felix Abel, where he's going to discuss sizing of the microgrid. Sizing of the microgrid is important to ensure that we have enough battery bank power and a big enough PV array size to meet our demand and also have resiliency in our microgrid system. We sized our battery using the system advisor model software from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Based on the demand data that we have from a commercial building, the recommended sizing that we use is shown below. Our battery bank size is 200 kilowatts. Our battery bank power is 100 kilowatts. And our des desired size for PV array is 200 kilowatts DC. Next, I'll be discussing the microgrid operation cost. Our microgrid operation scheme is important because we use that to maximize the efficiency of our PV and battery system. Our, matter, our operation scheme begins with the input of PV power, load demand, and grid power. We convert the PV power into current that is then injected into our battery and use the, load, the current from the load demand to subtract power from our battery. Based on our battery state of charge, we determine if we should either charge, discharge our battery. When our SOC is less than 40% or we are in off peak hours, we charge our battery and calculate battery degradation costs. When our battery is greater than 80% or we're in peak hours, we discharge our battery and calculate degradation costs. When our state of charge is above 90%, we sell our excess energy to the grid in order to get profit. And using all the calculated costs, we are able to get the total operation cost. And we loop through this algorithm for a 24 hour cycle. For the microgrid operation cost, we have a fixed operation cost for a system coming out to 257 with 58 cents. We have a variable operation cost for a system that's 119,054 cents. We have a replacement battery cost, which comes out to 24,244 with 51 cents. And we get a profit from our power sold to the grid of 2,148, giving us a total operation cost of 142,272.23 for a entire day. So for this next, I'll be going over the summary. The summary for our microgrid PV and battery was that we met the demand of our system. 
Our microgrid operation scheme is dependent on both time and state, in char and state of charge of our battery. Our microgrid is dependent on a battery, a PV array to charge our battery, and it is also grid connected to meet the demand when PV and battery do not meet the demand of the system. In order to test how the microgrid will react when put into islanded mode, we have an emergency diesel generator and governor to see how quick the grid's frequency will stabilize when disconnected. Thank you for coming to our presentation.